World War III is on the march. We got some very unsettling news coming out of Eastern Europe. A leader in Eastern Europe is warning their population in language I don't think I've heard from any leader in modern times. And uh, apparently they've received some information in the last 48 hours that does not bode well for what's about to happen next. We're going to talk about all the details of that, as well as the convergence of pretty much every army in Europe around this 40-mile strip of land. And on the other side of that, of course, is Belarus and Russia, who have tactical nuclear weapons. Something's about to pop off here. I'm going to explain it all. Okay, I'm going to put all the pieces together today. There's a lot of stuff going on. I'm going to address the inflationary incident that occurred today at the Baltimore Bridge, the mini Black Swan event. It seems every single day, and this is not to disrespect the dead, this is not to minimize the lives that were lost, but every single day we're seeing another inflationary incident like the one we're seeing in Baltimore where now that port is effectively going to be out of commission. They're saying this could cause backlogs for months, even years. Everything is inflationary. The price of energy only going to continue to go up from here on in, inflationary. The wars that we're going to have to fight, the ammunition that we're going to have to expend, inflationary. The, uh, just the little conflicts, identity politics, immigration, global decoupling, massively inflationary. These asymmetrical attacks on critical infrastructure, <coughs> excuse me, inflationary. Not saying this bridge incident was an attack, but... It's just a sign of Western decay, okay? That's all you can really say about it. It's entropy. Complex systems tend to decay over time if not properly maintained, and that is what is happening in the West. Uh, you're going to have to forgive me, guys. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to make it through this video because my head is full of mucus right now, and I'm on some of that Joe Biden, that Joe Biden Benny that don't be a bitch Biden. I'm not saying Joe Biden's a bitch. I'm saying don't be a bitch. Because when the shit hits the fan, a little calm and cold <clears throat> should not get between you and survival. So if I can't do my little daily update uh, while I have this brain fog, then, you know, uh, this is just one of those ways in which we test ourselves. So stop being a little bitch. Don't tell me I need to get some rest. Don't tell me I need work-life balance. We need to grind right now because the time is going to come when the water coming out of those taps, the power, the electricity, the lights, the ability to broadcast this to you over the internet, the climate control, all of the amenities of life, this is going to seem like the good old days no matter how sick I am right now. But don't worry, I'm on the mend. I woke up on Friday morning, I felt great. Saturday morning, I was sucking razor blades, man. It was the gnarliest sore throat I've ever had in my life, I think. As I get older, these colds, they hit me harder in the first 48 hours, but then I, I seem to just process it quicker. <clears throat> but the first 48 hours, it just gets harder and harder. Anyways, let's stay focused. We got to talk about what is going down in Eastern Europe because that's going to affect everybody. Take a look at this. NATO is thinking of imposing a no-fly zone. We said this was going to happen, and we said it's going to have to do with the F-16s. This is what they're planning on doing. This is how they're going to mission creep their way into this one. Get a load of this. What they're saying is that Poland recently, if you didn't know, and I should not assume that you know these things because I'm a news junkie, so let me just try to simplify everything and dumb it down. If it seems too dumbed down, I apologize, but there's some people who are not as up to speed as some of you. Poland recently had a Russian cruise missile pass within its territory for like 39 seconds. The reason the Russians do this is because they're trying to get behind Ukrainian missile defense. So in order to uh, circumvent the way that the launchers are pointed, or I don't know all the technicals of it, they try to go around. Okay, so in order to do that, they had to cross into Polish territory. Now, Poland decided not to shoot the missile down, even though... Legally, they could have. Uh, it was on their territory. The reason why they didn't, they claimed that they didn't want to do any damage to civilians, even though it was a very sparsely populated place. So a lot of people think they just bitched out, didn't want to start World War III. Kind of understandable. 
So anyways, now, however, they're talking about shooting these missiles down, but not just missiles that are inside Poland. Remember, they were talking about this in Romania, too, when you had that stuff happen on the Danube River. You probably don't remember. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Neither here nor there. What matters is that now they're talking about maybe we'll have to shoot missiles down if they come within a certain range of Ukraine. Okay? And here's why they're doing this. The Russians recently, in this volley of attacks post-incident, post-terrorist incident, destroyed an airfield in the city of Striyi, actively used to transport cargo to Ukraine. Now, these airstrips, if there ever is going to be an airstrip that the Ukrainians are going to be able to leverage for uh, deploying these F-16s, it's got to be there. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be in Poland or in Romania. I really got to sneeze. I'm going to try not to sneeze. Let's hold it back. It's not safe. It's not healthy to hold it back, she said. Anyways, <laughs> sorry, guys. And Joe Biden's already wearing off, man. Um, trying to make a light of a very depressing inflationary situation here. So if they can't, you know, manicure the highways to deploy these F-16s, where are they going to come from? They're going to come from Poland or Romania. So what Poland is now doing is they're trying to set it up so that these F-16s can fly from this airstrip without being destroyed by the Russians. So the Polands are going to use their Patriots or whatever sort of systems they have to shoot down these incoming Russian missiles. Well, if you're Russia and you're seeing Ukrainian F-16s, which are about to deploy, the Ukrainians have graduated from the programs. They can now technically fly the planes. They're going to be using the planes, so they say they're Ukrainians. We're not going to, and this is the thing, you're not going to know, right? That could all just be covered. You're never going to know the pilot who's in there because they're never going to fly over Russian territory and be shot down and run the risk of being, you know, pulled out alive. And then the Russians discovering that, oh, it's actually like a French pilot or something like that, right? So it, it, I, I really actually don't even, I don't even think they're going to need to put Ukrainian pilots in these F-16s, if at all. Like, why would you when you got a guy who's been flying for 10 years, who's been itching to do something his whole career? Anyways, so this is what's going to happen. The Russians are then going to incur attacks from these F-16s, whether they're successful or not. I'm sure they're going to have some success. And so they're going to have to be faced with, okay, how do we deal with this situation? Poland is now shooting down our missiles that we're using to try to shoot, to take out these airstrips. So ultimately then, what this has to entail is the Russians going to the source of the problem and then moving the war into Polish territory. I mean, when you think about it, if you take this to its logical conclusion, <clears throat> that's the only possible outcome here. Russia's ambassador to Poland was summoned about this incident, but they denied the request. Okay, so after this missile went into Polish airspace, the Russian ambassador who's in Poland was summoned, the guy who had blood poured on him at some protest 18 months ago by pissed off Poles, he denied the request. The only reason why you would ever deny a summons, okay? I mean, this is very serious. For them to deny that, if you thought that relations between Russia and Poland were about to end and that it was a foregone conclusion that you're going to be packing your bags anyways, so why even go and bother and have that conversation? The fact that they didn't even go to talk, this is very out of character for the Russians, okay? Usually, they're willing to play that game, that diplomacy game, even though, which is not to say they don't have their preconditions and just like everybody else, and they speak with a forked tongue, just like we do, but they're a little bit better at it, okay? But the fact that he didn't go, that says something. I don't think that ambassador has much time left in Poland. And with the information I'm about to share with you about everything else that's going on, uh, it's looking like that war is about to spill over within weeks. The same window that everybody's been predicting. Of course, we were the first to be talking about this, one of the first channels to be talking about this. But right around the time where this steadfast defender exercise is, is, is peaking in April, where everything is just going to come together for the perfect storm, the French troops, uh, the Belarusian troops, the, the whole nine yards. Okay. Uh, Vucic, the president of Serbia, 
This is a bit of a sidebar, <clears throat> but I think it might be relevant here. Let's have a have to have a sip of my coffee here. We're hardcore guys. This is how we're going to survive by putting ourselves through the ringer like this. SHTF doesn't take a day off and neither can I. Vusek has said in the last 48 hours, he's received bad information about a hard road ahead. And now I've never heard a leader talk to their constituents like this. Because usually when a leader wants to give you bad news, they're going to sugarcoat it. They're going to use euphemisms. If they're saying that, if they know that the situation is going to be very bad, they're going to say, we may have some challenging times ahead, but we will prevail. You know, they're going to, if the times are going to be moderately bad, they're going to say everything is just great. Difficult days are ahead for Serbia. At this moment, it's not easy to say what kind of news we've received in the last 48 hours. They directly threaten our vital national interests, both Serbia and Spurska. I'm not sure what or where that is. In the coming days, because I'm not an expert in this region yet, I will be soon. I will introduce the people of Serbia to all the challenges that lie ahead. It will be difficult, the most difficult so far. We will fight. Serbia will win. Talk about to the point, no bullshit, no sugarcoating it for your population. Rumor has it that uh, Kosovo may well be integrated into the uh, European Council soon. And uh, that that is going to, of course, trigger a conflict on that front as well. He may have been tipped off by... Vladimir Putin, apparently both Lukashenko and Putin could not sleep two nights in a row post-terror attack. Now, I don't know if that was just something they said for political purposes, but what it tells me is that they're very concerned that whoever orchestrated that attack actually in some way could be traced back to NATO or Western intelligence agencies. And if that is the case... That is a declaration of war, okay? It's the as declaration of war as it gets. Now, how these things typically work, uh, the, the Russian government came out today, three Russian officials, Vladimir Putin, Petrushev, and uh, I think the, the head of their security, the, their security chief or something like that, came out today and said it was the Ukrainians who did this, like flat out. Now, although they haven't presented any evidence of that yet, I'm going to say that that doesn't really matter because they have a common benefactor, okay? And that common benefactor is going to be whoever is puppeteering. The Ukrainian government is also probably who's ever puppeteering this ISIS-K group. And really, when you look at the motivations for why these guys did this, they got paid a paltry amount of money, you know, in terms of like what you would pay, like a hitman or something. And I don't know, but I just presume it's more than 5,000 bucks that these guys were promised. I know times are hard all over, but are they really that hard? And uh, the fact that nothing about this story makes sense, it's during Ramadan, it's, uh, it is sacrilegious from their twisted point of view to do something like this during that period of time. Typically, after they're going to do one of these atrocities, they're going to self-delete. They're not going to try to make a run for the Ukrainian border or the Belarusian border or wherever. And uh, yeah, and typically, there's it just a lot about this didn't make sense, even from the Russian point of view. And in terms of Russian complicity, was this a Russian false Like I don't know, because there's some things that don't make sense on either side, okay? I would probably venture to say that maybe this was orchestrated by a proxy uh, from Western intelligence agencies. Russia caught wind of it. Vladimir Putin thought maybe we can exploit this. Excuse me. Oh boy. That Benny really is wearing off quick. But again, this is just spitballing speculation. I'm not saying any of this definitively, but these are the angles you have to consider here, right? Because now Putin has carte blanche. He can go in there and do whatever he wants. And he's put a green light on pretty much everybody in the Ukrainian administration. Decision-making centers were hit. Karel Budinov, Ukrainian intelligence chief who's just been, you know, kicking it and uh, throwing drones at Russian critical infrastructure up until this point. He hasn't been put on the hit list for some weird reason. You know, he's still able to do what he's doing uh, without drawing the attention of the Russian government, it seems. But now he's on that list as a result of this incident. So... Whatever transpired, 
it was big, okay? This was a major escalation and it cannot be minimized. And since that time, we've seen massive bombardments. We've seen attacks on decision-making centers that we haven't seen before. We've seen this attack on the airstrip. And it's all going to come around with the F-16s. That's what I believe all of this is pointing towards. The Russians are claiming today that in addition to putting all these guys on the hit list, uh, they're reporting that a massive Iskander strike on an underground Ukrainian command center near Chazov Yar they claim that among those killed or wounded were several NATO officers, including Polish Brigadier General Adam Marzak. Now, this could be just disinformation. Okay, I'm just putting this out there. Take this one with a grain of salt. I always debrief you guys about that stuff because you got to be very careful. But here's what they say. Okay, get a load of this. A few hours after they claimed to have taken this guy out, Polish social media and news outlets reported that Brigadier General Marzak's death uh, occurred in stating that he unexpectedly died of natural causes. Because remember, a lot of these guys are what they call sheep dipped. So they're from NATO military, but so they don't trigger Article 5 and get into a war with Russia. They basically take them out of their insignia and they put them in mercenary clothing, and that's what they call sheep dipping. Okay, it's just taking your military guys. Uh, you know, uh, giving them their uh, walking papers from the military, and then you make them into mercenaries, then they enter the battlefield under the cover of mercenaries, so they're not representing your country. So you're not technically, you know, going to have to go to war. Anyways, so that's just another one of these uh, possible attacks that signals that the Russians are starting to uh, potentially escalate in terms of who they are targeting now. We have the exiling of Alexei Danilov. Now, this is the, was not the uh, Ukrainian security chief, but head of the National Security uh, Council, I believe. And he was very high up there in terms of next to Zelensky. So you have Zeluzhny, the commander who's been exiled to the UK. You have this guy who's been exiled to Norway. You have Victoria Newland, who's Audi, and it, it starts to look like they're, they're trying to set up like this government in exile piecemeal, knowing that eventually Zelensky is going to have to jump ship. Because what's going to happen is that the Russians are going to make a big move soon, and it appears as though the plan is to kind of cut it off at the Dnieper River. And so they're going to blow out all the bridges. They're going to make sure that NATO armies can't cross onto the right side of the Ukrainian, uh, the left bank of the, the Dnieper River, which is the Russian-controlled side at this point in time for the most part. Uh, and so what they want to do is, if they do, if Ukraine collapses, okay, Zelensky is going to be like the last one to go. And I wouldn't be surprised if he just goes on another speaking tour soon. And it's going to coincide with this period of escalation that we're about to see because then he's going to be out of the country. And uh, that's when a lot of Ukrainians are going to be very resentful. Uh, if, if this is in fact what they're getting ready to do, to do the whole rug pull thing and just jump ship, and uh, then there's going to be a lot of pissed off people. And when that happens, the Russians are probably going to be able to fill their ranks with recruits who are you know, going to be in defiance of the West. Because then all you're going to have after that is the West holding up that front. It's not going to be a Ukrainian government anymore. It's going to be this coalitional force in Western Ukraine, this mishmash of different groups, and whatever uh, vestiges of the Ukrainian government remain in place fighting against the Russians, the French, the Germans, Poles. Everybody's going to be in there. And this is that's World War III, right? So... Yeah, there's that. Um, let me talk about what's going on on the, uh, what time do we got here? My Benelin's wearing off. That Joe Biden's wearing off. I got to get some of them Biden drugs, man. I don't know how that guy makes it through a 20 minute speech. He's on some good stuff. Okay, so 
Lukashenko today with his designer dog, Pomeranian fluffy little dog, which must have been embarrassing for Vladimir Putin. I'm sure he got a phone call afterwards. But recall that about a month and a half ago, Lukashenko was giving a speech, and I showed this in one of my videos, and you could see by the consternation in his body language that he was very worried that the shit was about to hit the fan. And I think what I'm about to tell you is why. Today, he was 20 miles from Lithuania inspecting a tank battalion near the Suwalki Gap. Uh, this is the gap that connects Kaliningrad with Belarus. This is where things could go nuclear, okay? Uh, he was in military fatigues, it's important to note, and he was asking his commander, Nemenko, the head of the uh, Belarusian military, whether he could hold the territory with his troops, and he assured all actions are planned, issues of combat readiness are being worked out, and personnel are being prepared. Now, it should be noted that just nine miles over the border into Lithuania, there are German and U.S. mechanized battalions doing exercises as a part of Steadfast Defender. It's just, this place is buzzing with military activity, okay? It's just unreal what's going on. Now, Lukashenko also claimed about a few weeks ago, I think, that Polish-American intel was preparing a large-scale provocation against Polish civilians that would be blamed on Belarus. So NATO was going to make it look like Belarus did something, came across the border, fired a missile, fired some machine guns on the border, uh, maybe sent in a few saboteurs uh, as immigrants, because they're still dealing with an immigrant influx there that is being coordinated, and some of those could be sleeper cells, I presume. So that's why they're concerned. So that this is going to be a, a planned provocation to try to give NATO the license it needs to enter into a war with Belarus. Now remember, Belarus has tactical nukes. They're still under the control of Russia, but some people think that the strategy leveraged here by Russia is that this is how you can have a limited nuclear war, maybe even with France. You have Belarus wielding the nukes, okay, technically from their territory, thus not be getting a mutually assured destruction scenario. You can have a limited tactical nuclear exchange if it's even, you know, tactically useful at all is a another question. I'm sure they are. I mean, people say, well, there's no great concentration of troops, but I mean, the power of a nuclear weapon I mean, you know, in terms of, yeah, you can drop a lot of fab 500s or five 5,000s, I should say, but or 3,000s, I think those are the ones that they, they favor now. But when you can have one mini tactical nuke that is 10 times the power and you have thousands of them, I mean, eventually, you know, you're going to want to consider that, especially that many are, um, are able to not have any fallout, that the, a lot of the Russian weapons now are engineered to have very little fallout, depending on how it's detonated. Uh, we have an expert coming on that's gonna explain that. So this could be how it unfolds. This is how you could see the deployment of tactical nukes. But everything is shaping up around that region right now for something to go down, because eventually it has to come to this point. Now there's five possible ways that the French troops are going to be employed in Ukraine. One is that they're going to be deployed either to assist in the uh, development of weapons factories, and I don't see how you're going to do that unless you're doing it underground and under the cover of uh, multi-layered air defense, which of course is going to be in very short supply, but that is one possibility, and this is coming from a, a French mainstream news source, okay? These are the five possible ways that France, France enters into the conflict. They could also be sent in as trainers and uh, just partake in a capacity which is more auxiliary in nature, uh, not doing any sort of combat duties whatsoever, just training people and uh, you know, being, uh, doing consulting sort of thing, I guess. Uh, the other is that they take a more direct role and they defend Odessa. Odessa is very important to NATO because of course this is uh, Ukraine's only access to the Black Sea. If they lose that, 
they lose their shipping corridor and the Ukrainian economy is going to collapse. I mean, if it hasn't already collapsed. So they need this access to the Black Sea. Uh, this would allow Russia to forward deploy a lot of its ships that it's had to back deeper uh, towards uh, Sochi and uh, what is that other? Sea of Azov, I believe it's called. And uh, far away from the front, so the strikes are less accurate. And they just have to pull all that their warships back because Ukraine was targeting them with drones. So if they can basically get Ukraine out of the Black Sea, then they only have to worry about MI6 and you know things of that nature, which of course they have ways of working around. The other is to create a protective zone in the rear, either on the Belarusian northern border or in other positions throughout the country that's going to free up Ukraine to fight. Now, effectively, this is the same thing as going to war because you're doing the functions that Ukrainian soldiers would have to do in other places. You're not fighting them directly is the idea, but this is kind of four, four out of five in terms of um, escalatory things they could do. And of course, one of the most escalatory things they could do is fighting alongside Ukrainians in trenches, which is ultimately, I mean, that's already happening, right? The sheep dip troops, but eventually it is going to become more obvious and uh, it's going to become de jure. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this last story because this is just Russia's initial response, but they've rejected the US sea annexations. So you remember, I think it was a couple months ago when the US decided, yeah, we're just going to take this part of the Arctic and the Barents Sea. Is it the Barents Sea? Sea illegal. Yeah, Bering Sea. And uh, Russia says that they reject this. So ergo, a new front of World War III opens up. Guys, I think I got to call it quits for tonight. I have a feeling I'm going to feel much better tomorrow though. I've been making soap fight club style, only not out of uh, human lipids. I've been making it out of uh, cow fat. And we're going to show you guys how to do that soon. Very important. Hygiene is very important in the apocalypse because if you don't have hygiene, you're going to get sick and you don't want to, you know, be feeling like this when the shit hits the fan, but quite frankly, that's going to be the least of our concerns. So let's just enjoy the fact we got some over-the-counter medications to numb the pain. I know there's going to be some 10 out of 10 athletes out there who say you shouldn't use the toxic stuff. You try to Joe Biden your way through a daily update and uh, let me know how that goes without the Benny. Anyways, guys, if you want to support the channel, check out CanadianPreparedness.com and please go and check out if you're a novice shooter. Uh, if you feel like critiquing me and telling me everything that we did wrong in the videos, if you're just a troll, that's great too. But we released a series of videos. Three out of eight videos have been released. They're all about how to get into shooting, what they call comprehensive firearms training. In Canada, that's the euphemistic way we have to call tactical shooting, okay? So go check it out. Uh, I think it's, it's only going to get more informative as we go into the series. And I assure you that there's probably some concepts in there that a lot of uh, higher level operators even might benefit from just in terms of, you know, looking at things in a different way. But uh, again, watch it from start to finish because we kind of talk about, you know, different methodologies for training and why everybody's different. But it's a very difficult thing to get into and it's not until you really get out there and you start running the drills and then you put yourself in a stressful state that you realize how poor your performance is actually going to be in a situation where you might have to go John Wick style. Okay, let's just be brutally honest about that. Uh, it's not going to be as easy as you think and uh, we overestimate our abilities. So anyways, guys, thanks for watching. Gotta go.